Hi, Helen, thank you for joining us. If you wanna go ahead and take the poll, um, that would be great and we will get started in just a little bit. Thank you. We need music, right? Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, now they're popping in. If you're just joining us, um, please take time to take our poll, which is on the screen, and we will get started shortly. Thank you. Hey Sid, I see you on the on the group. Welcome. If you are joining us, uh, just joining us, so we do have the poll, as well as if you want to communicate with us, uh, you can put a comment into chat, um, or if you have a question, you can use Q and A. Hey, Sheila, I think some of us are not seeing those poll questions. Is that right? Oh, you know why? Thank you, Diane. <laughs> there they are. Yeah, we do. Thank you. For no, nope. thank, thanks, Sid. Sid put it in the chat. I know, I just <laughs> saw it. So thanks, Sid. Sid's one of my team ARP folks. Competes in the Senior Olympics. Oh, cool. Yeah. What sport or what event? Actually, he does several. He, I mean, uh, Sid, you can put it in chat, but um, he does ping pong and That's so cool. uh, I think he does shuffleboard. Um, I don't know if he runs, but yes, yes, very active. So thanks again, Sid, for that. Appreciate it. So as you um, vote, just, um, there are three questions. Okay, here, he put it in here. Ping pong, <laughs> running, pool, and bicycling. Oh, pool, I forgot all about that. So, and a yeah. dot, 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 like maybe there's more. <laughs> uh, yeah. And maybe more. Yeah. And someone said they just played their first game of pickleball last night. That's a sport that I really want to learn because all of my aunts and uncles play. And I feel like it's a lifetime sport that you can play for a pretty long time. So we did a tournament not to like, well, I guess it's a couple of years now ago, um, but um, I'm connected with the Missouri Pickleball Association and they want us to host another cool. tournament or another event. So I will keep you posted on that, Gretchen. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's fun. Actually, they're building a facility hmm. here in Fenton that's going to have, I don't know, 18 courts. So, wow. Yeah, pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah. If you're just joining us, if you'll take time to do the now on the screen poll um, for the workshop, it helps inform us of what you're really interested in and um, help us to provide you some additional information. So we have four people that have completed it so far. Thank you very much. It is anonymous, so we won't know who needs to fix their bathroom or their bedroom or whatever room, so. People are slowly trickling in. I think this beautiful weather may keep some people from joining us today. <laughs> Probably playing pickleball. Yes, probably. Yeah. Or hiking or cycling or gardening. Yeah. So many. Just sitting outside sounds wonderful. Yes. Yes, it does. I'm sitting here with the windows open. Yeah. So if you've just joined us, um, there's a poll on the screen. Please take time to complete it. And um, this will help us with the presentation today. 
And again, it's anonymous, so we won't know who says what. Mary Tillman is on. Mary Tillman has been a longtime volunteer with AARP. Mary, thank you for joining us. Let's see what time are we at now. We're a little bit after. We've got nine of uh, almost, we've got 90% of the participants have done the vote. So if you're that number 10, if you could take time and complete that, that would be great. You don't have to. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. If someone um, joins us, that's great. Um, people can come in easily and still gain a lot of information. So I um, first want to welcome you to the Home Fit Workshop uh, presented by AARP. And I am Sheila Holm. I am with AARP Missouri. However, I am based in St. Louis. So um, we're gonna go ahead and um, share the uh, results of the survey. So we're gonna end the polling and I'm gonna share the results. So you will see bathroom, it's the spot. I think that's a pretty common thing and our uh, presenters will talk a little bit about that um, who I'll introduce shortly. And most of you are here for yourselves, which is great. You're planning ahead. So, and most of you wanna get work done. Well, some really planning ahead more than a year in advance and some in three months. So um, got a good spread there of that. So thank you for taking time to complete our poll. I'm going to close that. So um, I, I want to um, share with you that we're going to be um, covering a lot of ground um, on the home, on your home, on your future home, to make sure that it's safe and comfortable for you as you age. So um, I have, we have presenters here today that are gonna help with that. Um, but before we get started, I want to make sure everyone understands web, the Zoom webinar. So um, you cannot, so we will not be able to hear you unless we unmute you or see you. However, you can use the chat, which is at the bottom screen, it has a little conversational bubble there, and you can chat at any time and um, we will be able to see that as well as the participants. If you have a question, you can use the Q&A area for that. So again, if you have questions, we have volunteers that are available to answer or assist you um, as best they can with any challenges you might have. Later on, you may be asked a question. We may want you to um, see if anyone wants to raise their hand and actually speak. And you will see a hand at the bottom of your uh, control panel as well. And that's when you would click on that and a little hand will show up uh, for us. So we will know it um, then. So, um, all right. So now I'm going to, let me, Sorry, I didn't do something in advance. So uh, Gretchen, you're now a co-host. So um, we're gonna go ahead and go to the next screen. So this is just a basic agenda um, of the things we're going to cover and um, the perks of making your home fit. I don't know about perks, but there are really good things about it, which will enable you to stay in your home safely as you age, universal design. Um, elements and concepts. Gretchen has extensive experience in that. And we're going to go room by room 
and look at, you know, what are ways that you can make your home fit your needs um, as they change. One thing you're going to notice throughout the presentation, you're going to see a green star and a green star is next to um, things that you can make um, make those changes easily in your home. So take note of those because Gretchen's going to ask you um, to note two of those at the end of the presentation. Okay. So a quick introduction. So I've already done me. I'm doing here my favorite thing, which is gardening. So um, our main presenter is Gretchen Kingma, and she is an occupational therapist, a real estate professional, and she has lots of certifications that qualify mm -hmm. her to talk about this topic. And, um, and Gretchen, I'll let you introduce Chelsea, uh, who's a special guest that we have today. So I'm going to kick it over to Gretchen. Great. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I am, like Sheila said, Gretchen Kingma. I'm an occupational therapist as well as a realtor. I created a business called Empowered Homes, and we have three little sectors of Empowered Homes, one being education. So doing things like this to educate you on the um, possibilities of staying in your home forever. Um, another section is real estate sales, which is exactly what it sounds like. And then um, consultation. So I work with builders and contractors on helping people modify their homes to making their homes universally designed and um, functional for them to stay in long term. So that's a little bit about me. And today I have a level two fieldwork student from Washington University's Occupational Therapy Program. And she is with me for a mighty 12 weeks um, to learn about how I am bringing occupational therapy into the real estate and housing industry spaces. So she'll be presenting on the exterior of the home as well as the bathroom. And again, this is Chelsea and I'm Gretchen. So I'm going to test and see if I can make the slide go. I, I know I'm co-host, but I don't think that I have the power to move this puppy forward. All right, so today for our um, home fit presentation, we are going by the end of our time together, you're gonna to be able to recognize how a home can be modified to support changing needs that we all have. Um, determine which modifications are important for maintaining the lifestyle that you have and desire to have. And then number three, distinguish between modifications that are DIY, very low skill required, DIY stands for do it yourself, um, versus the ones that need a professional. So low level modifications all the way up to high level modifications. So let's go to the next slide. And I want you all just to brainstorm with me if everybody will participate in a cheesy activity, close your eyes, and I want you to envision home. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word home? Go ahead and put it in the chat. <laughs> Someone says safety, family. Peaceful space, that's a really good one. For me, it's sanctuary. It's where I can be myself. Oh, before we move on, we do have a question in the chat, um, and it says, what is the number one cause of accidents in homes of elderly? And it's interesting that this question would arise because in the poll at the very beginning, the majority of you all reported that your bathroom is where you need um, the, the largest modification or just modifications in general. And I will tell you that I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's over 78%. It's in the low 80 percentile of all accidents, falls that happen at home, happen in the bathroom. So th those have a correlation. Um, need for modification and falls both occur in the bathroom. So that, I hope, answers the question a little bit. But those are really great um, 
definers of home. And I appreciate you guys playing along. So let's go on to the next slide and talk about the cost of not staying in your home. So it's fair for me to point out that, again, the modifications that we will talk to talk about today vary drastically in cost and level of skill required. However, when you think about the cost and you simultaneously think about cost of or monthly cost of private duty home health, which is approximately 4,500 a month. Um, if you think about adult daycare outside of the home, that's approximately 1,600 a month. Um, when you think about assisted living, the stat I have here is approximately 4,000 per month. I will say it is a lot higher in St. Louis from my personal experience. Um, and a skilled nursing facility, also known as a nursing home, can be upwards of 7,500 to 8,000 a month for a semi-private or private room. So when you think about those costs monthly, making a one-time large modification to your home might actually be more economically savvy. So I just like to point that out um, because a lot of people think, and, and I, I believe it's because it's the way that our culture has traditionally been. We get too old, we can't stay in our home, we move on to the old folks home, the senior living community, um, and that's not the case. So it's important to weigh financially and economically um, the benefits or not of modifying your home. So now that we've talked a little bit and set the stage, we're going to move on to the next slide and talk about the overall concept of universal design. And universal design may sound uber technical, but it's actually a really simple concept. Universal design is an approach to designing products and environments, aka your home, to accommodate all people, including those with physical, cognitive, or sensory impairments. So a type of design that benefits all people of all ages of all abilities. It, along with a livability, and visitability are the basis of the home fit guide. So the modifications we're gonna talk about today come from universal design principles. Making modifications that are low maintenance and energy efficient can improve the livability of a home. Making modifications so that anyone who uses a wheelchair, walker, cane, any sort of mobility device um, so that they can come in your space will increase the visitability of a home. These include at least one zero step entrance, wider doorways, and at least a half bath on the main floor. So again, to highlight, those are the, the features of a visitable home. That's a word that we don't, you're probably thinking that I made up, um, but it is, it is a movement in the housing industry currently to have high visitability within a home. So now we're gonna take you room by room, as Sheila mentioned, through a home, exploring each of the main areas um, with a lot of emphasis on the bathroom because we told you that that's where the majority of falls happen. So our first stop on our home tour is going to be the exterior. And I am gonna let Chelsea take over from here. I'm gonna put myself on mute. All right, here we go. There we go. All right, so I am going to talk about the exterior of the home. So actually getting into the house. So the best adjustment to an entryway is the creation of a zero step entrance. So that's what Gretchen just touched on. And a zero step entrance are those that are accessible to all people, whereas raised entryways and steps may be a challenge for those with mobility limitations. So think of people who are using wheelchairs or walkers. Ideally, a home should have at least one zero step entryway entry. Quick story for you. I have a nine month old daughter and it can be such a struggle trying to tilt her stroller up the <laughs> stairs while I'm holding open the storm door to get into our house. And not to mention we have a 100 pound dog that is racing in after us. So I can almost guarantee that if we had a zero step entrance to our house, it would be a lot easier. So again, a lot of these recommendations that we are um, sharing with you all come from universal design principles, meaning that they benefit people of all ages, all abilities, and um, 
that zero step entrance is just one of those. So it is important to keep in mind that a zero step entrance does not have to be created for the front door. It can also be a side entrance or a good garage entry door. They can also be created with landscaping by adding sloping pathways as shown on the picture. If you decide that you want to use landscaping to create that zero step entrance, then it needs to be done by a professional landscape architect. So keep in mind that you will have to determine whether or not it is practical to create a zero step entrance because of the particular landscaping and size of the yard. So be sure to consult with a contractor or an occupational therapist to discuss your options. And we can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so when a zero step entryway cannot be achieved, there are ways to make sta steps safer for all. So steps need to be well lit, free from obstruction, including trees and shrubs. I see that a lot of overgrown shrubbery in front of the um, entrance, and that can be a barrier for some people. So you wanna make sure that that is free from obstructions, and you wanna make sure that you have railings on both sides. So the railing should extend past the last step to ensure a safe transition for all people. So as you're coming down the stairs, the rails should go past that last step. Additionally, wherever space allows, steps can be adapted into walker steps, which means that they just have deep treads and short risers. So these walker steps are generally 22 inches deep and four inches high. So this design allows for people who use a walker or a cane to easily and safely utilize the steps and can be a good alternative to ramps. And we can go ahead to lighting. Perfect, so this is just a quick reminder to take note of the green stars that are on the slide. So remember that these green stars are indicators that these are quick fixes. So these are things that you can probably do yourself or with the help of someone down the street. Um, and these are also things that you wanna make note of because in your home fit worksheet, you'll be kind of coming up with a plan for yourself as far as the quick fixes that you can do. So since we've covered various ways to modify the exterior of the home for safety, let's talk about lighting. So outdoor lighting is a must for safety reasons. You'll want to make sure that at least one entryway light is at a height that does not require someone to be on a ladder in order to change the light bulb to make maintenance doable by anyone. You should also consider adding pathway lighting that leads to the front entryway that will allow visitors and delivery people to safely approach the home after dark. This is an example of a quick fix. Finally, prominently displaying your address number helps delivery people and first responders find your home. Illuminated numbers or numbers made of a shiny, reflective or glow in the dark material are the most visible at night. This is another quick fix. There are also a lot of exterior lights that have dusk to dawn features. So consider those for your outdoor lighting needs. Um, so you can take the hassle out of remembering to switch your lights on and off every day. All right. All right. So now that we have talked about entryway and exterior of a home. I would love for you all to participate in this next poll. I don't know if you saw the picture. Um, previous picture had a doorbell that didn't look like a normal doorbell. It was a smart doorbell. So we're gonna talk about smart home technology. And I think there's, oh, there'll be another poll. There it is. So if everyone could participate in the poll and let us know, do you have any smart home features in your home? You might have them and not even know it because Amazon Alexa or the Google Assistant or Ring Doorbell, um, even your iPhone can be a piece of smart technology. So let us know if you have smart technology, if you use it currently, if you're enthusiastic about the smart home technology in your home. Not sure. Not sure because we we don't have it. So maybe if you learn about the crazy cool things that smart technology can do for you in your home, you will be a little bit more enthusiastic about it. It's fun to see all these answers come in though. All right. So here's the results. Oh, I got a comment saying that my internet is going in and out. Can you all hear me?
It, it just, it's just intermittent. Yeah. Just Are every now and then. Yep. You're, you're good, Gretchen. Yep. All right. We'll carry on and I apologize for the internet. We'll do our best because occupational therapists are all about adapting and adjusting the environment. So my apologies. We'll move on to the next slide. Thank you for taking the poll. Some people have smart home features, some people do not. But let's talk about some smart home technology and how it can help you in your home. So home-based automation systems. Oh, there's the results for our poll. If you wanna take a look at those. Um, to know that you are not alone if you're not sure. You're not alone um, if you use it. We're all, we're kind of all over the board, which is really exciting. All right. So thanks for playing with the polls. Um, like I was saying, home-based automation systems and products, think things like Amazon Alexa or the Google Home, or even a Nest, which is a thermostat, um, those things are all able to provide real-time information and perform home-based tasks with little more than an internet connection, no pun intended because my internet's not so hot right now, <laughs> but an internet connection and a voice command. So if you, if you have severe arthritis, if you have mobility issues and it's a total pain in the backside to get up and turn the lights off at night when you're ready to go to bed, Smart home, virtual home assistants, like what you see on the, sh on the screen, can help you turn your TV off, turn your lights off, turn your lights on, um, even lock your front door um, to ensure safety. If you forgot to make that trip by the front door, you go to bed, press a button on your phone, and your house could be secure, um, again, with the push of the button. So keep in mind that you'll want to ensure that you have sufficient internet, and you'll also want to make sure that you consult a professional when installing these things so they can make sure that they're all working together. But if you have any sort of interest or desire to incorporate some smart home technology within your home, reach out to a contractor or an occupational therapist and have that conversation about how you can make your house work for you. Um, I won't tell you, never mind. <laughs> I was gonna give you an example of a TV show that I used to watch when I was a young, a young child um, that did all these things. I guess the, the is it the Jetsons? Um, the home of the future from 10, 15, 20 years ago, our houses can actually do that for us now. So if you have difficulties with any of these tasks, reach out and we would love to connect you with someone to set these things up. We'll move on to the next slide and talk about smart home lighting and electrical. I already touched a little bit on it in the previous slide, but I want to highlight that you can connect your lights to your virtual home assistant. So you can turn them off and on with a voice command. How cool is that? Additionally, you can connect lamps. So if you don't want all your overhead lights to be turned on and off by your phone or your voice command, you can just do one or two lamps. Um, another thing to improve safety is you can control this from your phone if you're out with friends or you went to a weekend at the lake to shop with your girlfriends um, you can turn lights off and on just from a click of a button so that it looks like somebody is home it should be noted though that not all light bulbs are created equally um, they come in a range of shapes and sizes and brightness levels and choosing the right bulb can make a safer can make a home safer and make a space more useful and enjoyable. So if you look at your home fit guide on page 15, there's more information on choosing the right lighting for whichever application that you're looking to apply that to. So our next area of the home focuses on entryway, a little bit different than the exterior. It's once you step foot into the house, and we're gonna talk about entryway. First and foremost, doors. When planning accessible entryways, the most important consideration is the size of the door. Specifically, the width of the doorway opening should be at least 32 inches to allow for a wheelchair to pass through. So that is at least, and that's the opening. So not the entire door, but the door jam um, to the door jam. So the opening part. And now universal design um, criteria is even saying 36 and upwards of 42 inches, but 32 inches is pretty good for allowing wheelchairs because there are not many wheelchairs that are wider than that. So 32 inches is a good rule of thumb. 
When possible, door thresholds should be less than three fourths of an inch. If they are not, then you, you can use like a ramp or um, a, like a transition piece to create a ramp like effect if the threshold is greater than three fourths of an inch. When the measurement is just an inch or two too small in that wide in the opening, you can use a, a hinge like you see here, which is called a swing clear hinge. So it opens and then opens again to let the door go flat against the wall. So these are some ideas um, on entryway specific to the door. We'll move on and talk about the doorbells and the actual function of opening the door. If a door does not have a glass panel and there isn't a window nearby, a peephole can help residents see who's outside um, before opening the door. But if you have low vision or if your eyes ever give you fits, um, to put it simply, you can go back to that smart technology and also consider a ring doorbell like what's photoed here. Um, a, a doorbell that has a camera will allow you to see on your phone so that you don't get up and go if you, if you don't wanna see the person that's at the door. So that's a video doorbell and they come in all shapes, sizes, different brands. I don't mean to throw ring out there. Um, they're, they're, they're like styrofoam, like foam cups come in all sorts of brands, but styrofoam made, the, made it popular. So write down if you're taking notes, video doorbell. Next, um, if you look at the door in the picture, instead of having a handle, it has a lever style, um, or instead of a knob, it has a lever style handle. And this makes it easier than the doorknob or the thumb latch um, with, with those who have um, arthritic or fine motor concerns. Um, a doorknob lock isn't the best choice for an exterior door either. Um, so the lock, the lock too, the lock can too easily and unintentionally be pressed or turned. So therefore the lever style handle is better for both um, manipulation skills with your hands, but also for safety. A higher tech solution for an entryway, entryway lock is a digital door lock, which we just talked about. And that is another example of how to use um, automation technology. You can have something that opens as soon as you walk up to your door, as long as you have your phone in your pocket or purse. That can save you from digging out of your groceries or your bag or um, having to take your eyes off of your environment to look for your keys. So. I'm trying to um, give you examples to think further of how these automation systems can benefit you in getting from outside to inside and through that entryway. We'll go on to the next slide. So looking at actual entry spaces. So we've gone from exterior through the door, entryway, and now we're at the entry space. A lot of people call these um, your drop zone. And not everyone has a large or formal foyer or entryway, but most homes do have some sort of transitional area just inside the entry door. And that space should be free of clutter and provide storage for things that are carried or worn. Natural light and open spaces also prevent trips and falls and allow occupants ease of movement in this space. I would love for you all to put in the chat, what do you think is the number one thing that I see in an entryway that causes trips and falls? Everybody has them. I have one in my entryway. Put it in the chat. Doormat, thank you, Sid. Um, a doormat is definitely an example. Another, a coat rack is a good example. A rug, rugs are the worst. They're beautiful and they, they add a lot of aesthetic to our space, but they, I have not done formal research on this, but I would bet aside from the bathroom, throw rugs are the number two reason for, for falls in a home. Um, and that's, again, not a research statistic, but from my personal experience treating people in the rehab hospital. So things just to consider when setting up your entryway space, make sure that you don't have a rug that has loose corners or corners that roll up um, a rug that doesn't move around. If you must have a rug, make sure it's very low pile, that it doesn't have a threshold or half an inch um, wide or deep, I guess, 
tall so that if you have a walker or a cane, you're not going to trip um, and lose your balance. So at, additionally to the entry space, adding a place to sit in that space provides a location to put on and off your shoes safely um, and also a place to store things. So you can see in the picture, it's not only a place to sit and put your shoes off and on, but there's cubbies that help you get things out of the walkway and store them away so, to prevent further falls um, from happening. So finally, if there's no closet in the foyer, consider adding wall hooks for coats, hats, and purses. Somebody put in there um, a door or a coat hanger, and that is very true because it has, a lot of them have three to four legs that stick out like this, wider than the actual bar of the coat rack. And so while our eyes are set on hanging our coat on that hook, our feet forget about the, the um diameter that it spreads and we can trip up on that. So this is saying to add hooks to the wall, keeping things up and out of the floor space. Thank you for playing. Let's move on to the kitchen. So regardless of how many rooms a home has, would you agree with me? Residents and guests tend to congregate in the kitchen. We've all heard that the kitchen is the heart of the home. Even if you have a super small kitchen, people are always going to hang out in the kitchen but even the most welcoming kitchen has its hazards. Some examples of kitchen hazards are fires, spills, slips, trips, dropping things. Um, if you have poor sensation or weak hands, an occasional mixing bowl might get dropped. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of accidents can occur in the kitchen and home fitting interventions to make the kitchen safer and easier um, are so important for both the visitor and the cook of the kitchen. So since your desire and need to cook may change throughout your life, let's consider ways that you could change the way that a certain kitchen would work for you. For example, standing at the counter or your island to prepare food may be too taxing. I'm only 31 and standing at the island is a little bit taxing for me. Um, so as we age, our bodies can't handle the, the input um, of what it requires to stand for long periods of time at a counter space. Um, so here's an example of a lower counter that has a, um, a clear underneath area so that a chair could pull up. If you were in a wheelchair, you could wheel up to this counter. This is typically called an alternating height counter. So thinking about um, modifying your home to have a space like this, um, if you're thinking, well, home renovation or kitchen renovation is not in my budget, another way to achieve this is to get a, a table at Ikea or a store that is affordable, a, an affordable furniture store, find a table that's lower than your tabletop, put the table together and scoot it up against your counter space. And that way you're creating the alternating counter height effect without doing a huge remodel. Another, another thing that this can benefit um, is energy conservation. So you may, you may have really strong legs and not be a wheelchair user, but you might tire easily. So think of things like um, congestive heart failure or COPD or you know, COVID, you know, that's a very unfortunate thing, but anything that affects your, um, your endurance, this would be help because you could sit down to do your task. So let's move on and talk about the cabinets and shelving and drawers. There are many, many things to consider when making a kitchen accessible. And those range from quick fixes to again, harder remodels um, that require professionals help. So some quick fixes for the kitchen include reorienting adjustable lighting, adding stick under the cabinet lighting um, so, that the, so that your workspace is better lit. Um, Moving everything that you use frequently from high shelves to low shelves. Um, another easy fix is instead of doing a whole new kitchen remodel, take the cabinets, your lower cabinets that you already have and have a contractor come and put in um, these slide out shelving units like you see in the picture. So you're not redoing the whole kitchen, but you're adding a feature that allows you to slide your shelves out. So you're not bending down and having to get halfway into your cabinet when you want something from the back. So those are examples of um, the lighting and then adjusting the cabinet shelving are examples of those green, green star features that we talked about at the beginning. Easy modifications that would have a high functional return. 
Other professional renovations could include open shelving. Um, I joke often that Chip and Joanna Gaines, if you've ever heard of them, have jaded our generation because they have this aesthetic that they think every house should look like. But one of the things that they made really popular was that open shelving. So getting rid of your upper cabinets and having open shelving um, would benefit someone that has poor range of motion in their shoulders, poor dexterity in their hands. So you no longer have to reach up to the highest shelf, open a cabinet, swing it open. Um, it, it's just accessible and right there. And you can put them low to the counter or a little bit higher. You can pick where you put them. So that's another example um, of kind of a middle of the middle of the road renovation. I wouldn't recommend DIY, but it's not a huge expense either. Let's look at actual hardware of the kitchen and move on to the next slide. Um, handles and hardware can be relatively easy to modify. I will say you can find anything on YouTube. I just switched out a um, kitchen faucet and if I can do it, anybody can. Um, but these are things that um, may require the help of a plumber, but first consider the handles on your existing cabinets and faucets. Um, D-shaped handles and drawer poles like the ones in the picture are much easier to grasp than knobs. If you look at the picture, you can imagine just sticking your hand down within the handle instead of having, again, the fine motor dexterity of a knob or some, I see circle, I see shapes. Um, anytime that there's a full loop enclosure, that's going to be easier to open as far as our dexterity goes. And then on the faucets, a lever style um, handle is going to be much easier than something that you have to turn or one that has um, hot and cold, a single lever style. And now they even sell um, faucets that you can touch or motion. Those would be the utmost as far as the universal design spectrum goes. One that you could wave your hand in front or just tap to get the water flowing would be uber accessible. So let's look at kitchen appliances. When considering appliances, there are many options that have helpful features to choose from. There are also a few features to be mindful of when considering safety and convenience. Although placing the microwave above the oven may be a safe a space saver, and it's typically what has been done for many, many years now, lifting and lowering heavy things that you're warming up out of a hot microwave can be very difficult and dangerous. So considering a counter height microwave, putting your microwave on the counter, or even an under counter microwave, I'm seeing a lot of microwaves be put in drawers. Um, a pull out drawer can have a microwave, a microwave drawer, um, or even just a shelf below the counter that you place your microwave in. And that is considered universal design because it can, it can be beneficial for a four-year-old wanting to warm up their snack, as well as a 104-year-old in a wheelchair so that they can cook their own meals throughout the day. Another example is thinking about your stove, your stove top. Cook, consider those models that have controls on the front, not the back. And the reason being is if you have an open flame or a hot plate, if it's electric, you have to reach over the heat. If you have something that has a lot of material, or if you have poor, again, range of motion or shoulder strength, you might not reach all the way and burn your arm. So things to think about um, when thinking about stovetop or cooktop. Another thing, um, not pointing out any brands in particular, but there are many, many um, appliance brands now that have safeguard features. So that would be a universal design feature. For example, a gas cooktop or a gas stove that turns off automatically after 30 minutes of use or an hour of use. They have them where you can set them. And so that way there's tolerance for error. I, again, I'm only 31, but I forget things. And maybe I finish my meal. I'm so hungry. I go sit down and I don't turn the stove off. If you're looking for appliances, ask, your, ask the salesperson at the appliance store if they have any with safety features like that, because it can prevent injury and heaven forbid a house fire. Looking at the drawer styles of the appliances, such as the pictured refrigerator is so important. Um, we just bought a refrigerator for our basement and I was appalled at some of the lack of functional design. So making sure that there are big, prominent, again, D style handles to make it easier to open the fridge is so important. 
You can find suggestions on different modification and lighting and flooring uh, for the kitchen also on the Home Fit Guide page eight through 10. So let's move on to the bathroom. I did tell you that this is where the majority of falls happen. So I'm putting the pressure on Chelsea to share with you bathroom safety. All righty. So when considering making changes to your bathroom, remember to keep in mind ease of use and safety. It's a good idea to go over each component of the bathroom as you decide which tips you will incorporate into your bathroom. Sometimes more attention is paid to how a bathroom is decorated rather than the safety of the space. But falling in the bathroom is painful and potentially life-threatening because of the many hard surfaces. And as Gretchen mentioned earlier, one of the most common places to fall. So first, we're going to talk about the shower. There are many options available for someone who has mobility limitations, and many of those options are temporary and very cost-effective. First, you have a permanent fixture, which is the shower bench that's pictured um, in the upper right hand corner. And then you also have a portable feature, which is a transfer chair or a shower seat. So shower seating is a relaxing safety feature for all people. So as Gretchen mentioned earlier, even if you have the mobility or the strength to be able to get in and out of the shower, you may not be able to have that endurance. So if you have COPD or COVID, or even if you are um, have someone who's visiting who's pregnant, when I was pregnant, I got tired. <laughs> very easily my heart would be racing just after standing for a few minutes so having that shower bench or something in the shower where I could sit down would have been very helpful um, additionally an adjustable height handheld shower head makes the shower customizable for everyone of different heights and again different abilities so this is not an easy to do or a DIY, but this is a harder to do and it requires the assistance of a professional. And that is a wide doorless shower with a zero step entry. And this is considered accessible for all people. And that includes people who use wheelchairs and someone who may need someone else's assistance in order to complete their showering task. So a zero step shower um, inserts are available from those big box stores. So think Home Depot. Um, similar least suitable options include full swing shower doors or the use of a shower curtain or partial wall to cover the opening. Okay, so next we are going to talk about the toilet and out of curiosity, I want you to drop in the chat if you have ever heard of a comfort height toilet. Let's see how many people have them or have heard of a comfort height toilet. Ooh. Oh, so we have some mixed responses. Well, if you haven't ha heard of a comfort height toilet, essentially it's a toilet that's a little bit higher than the standard 15 inch height toilet. So this one is going to be only comfortable if you're a certain height. That can be true to a certain extent. Thank you for that. Um, so these are toilets that are about 17 inches to 19 inches high. And the reason why someone might need a comfort height toilet is because it reduces the amount of effort that it takes to sit and stand from the toilet. So let's say that you've had a hip replacement or you have arthritis, um, then a comfort height toilet may be a little more comfortable for you as far as getting on and off the toilet when you do your business. Um, so for people who are shorter in stature, like myself, I'm only five feet, nothing, um, then a comfort height toilet may not be as comfortable. So I think it was Diane who mentioned that. Sorry, yes. <laughs> so you could consider having one um, if you have one person who might benefit from a comfort height toilet and someone who um, may not benefit from a comfort height toilet, such as, such as a child, then you may consider only adding one comfort height toilet to one bathroom if you have more than one bathroom in your house. If you do need to add height to an existing toilet and you're not interested in a comfort height toilet, then you can add a toilet base riser. And um, these will add about three and a half inches to an existing toilet. And these usually cost less than $100. So an example is in the bottom left corner on the slide. Something that's not pictured here is a bidet, and Gretchen absolutely loved bidets, so I am going to talk about it. Um, but a bidet is a, an addition to the bathroom that you can add 
which will basically help you clean yourself after using the restroom and replaces the toilet paper. So they're very popular in Europe um, and you just kind of twist the handle, some water will squirt out and you'll get clean and everything and you can get up and moving from there. But this can be really good for people who may have limited finger dexterity. So maybe you um, can't reach back and grab the toilet paper or, you know, manipulate the toilet paper in your hand, then a bidet may come in handy. And even if you're not interested in adding a bidet now, what a lot of people are doing is adding an outlet beneath the toilet that will allow you to add a bidet later, okay? And finally, the last thing that's pictured here in the upper left-hand corner is a commode chair. And that's the least expensive option for helping someone get on and off the toilet. And these are a temporary fixture. So it's just for a temporary situation. Maybe you just had surgery and you're just needing some help for a little while, or maybe remodeling is not an option for you at the moment. Um, so you can use the commode chair instead. And we can go to the next slide to talk about grab bars and assist bars. So we've all experienced a sliding on a wet, slippery floor before. And that's why we want to ensure that the bathroom has a grab or assist bar for someone to hold on to when they are feeling unstable. So there are plenty of different options out there now. So you're not limited to the traditional medical equipment looking grab bars um, like we may have seen in the past. So there are a lot of stylish, high quality grab bars that are out there and can be integrated into the common bathroom features such as the toilet paper roll and soap dishes like the ones pictured on the slide. So it is very important to make sure that when having grab bars installed into the house that they are done so um, correctly, okay, because this is vital for safety. So you want to make sure that they're installed on supportive blocking. And this blocking is between the studs of your wall. So it's just a piece of wood that's been added horizontally between the studs to make sure that when the grab bar is installed by a professional onto that blocking that it doesn't fall when someone puts their entire weight on it. So you don't want to bring the wall down with you as you're using it to support mm -hmm. yourself. So you should not use grab bars to have a clamp or a suction comes because these will probably not be stable enough to carry someone's weight. So research has indicated that grab bars or assist bars are safest, safest when they're installed horizontally rather than vertical or diagonal. So if you're using these for, for safety reasons, you wanna make sure that they are horizontal. So be sure to refer to your home fit guide, pages 22 and 23 on more safety modifications for the bathroom. And next we're gonna move on to living spaces. Thank you, Chelsea. So we've taken you from the exterior through the entryway. We've talked about the kitchen and the bathroom. Now we're going to round it out with overall living spaces and some catch-all in everybody's home. So I want you to think about a time that you had a lot of family over in your over at your home and everyone is gathered in the living room. Depending on how your space is set up, there may be things that you need to watch out for. I'm sure we can all think of a time Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, whatever holiday that you gather um, your, your family. Think about, um, have, you, have you ever had to reach for a small child that may um, knock the edges of sharp furniture or electrical, tripped over an electrical cord of a lamp um, or pulled on the blinds string over and over and over again? These things that we laugh about in those moments where we have our family over crowding the living room are actually huge safety hazards. So fa any family member that has a mobility issue or not, a child playing with a string um, of blinds can be a huge safety issue. So things like that that I just mentioned um, that might not be thought of until it becomes an issue are very important to think about. So Always anchor tall furniture, um, tall furnishings to the wall to prevent tripping, tall and short. Um, I have a small bookcase in my basement that my two-year-old tumbled over before I could even put, luckily, before I could put books on it. And I told my husband, let's go get the drill and anchor this to the wall. So anchor furniture um, to prevent tipping. Secure exposed cords by using um, adhesive tape to get it up against the wall or those covers. They have cord covers that make it um, very streamlined and not in the way. You could provide about two feet of clear space 
between a coffee table or ottoman and the couch so that people have a clear way when they're going from sitting to standing or pivoting once they're in the standing position to turn, making sure that there's enough way for them to move. About two feet is a good rule of thumb. Um, avoid those furniture items that have sharp corners and always, always, always secure window treatment cords to prevent entanglement. I know that sounds morbid, um, but not only entanglement, but trip hazards. If you have a really long cord, that is a very common because it's usually white to blend in with your wall and your blinds um, so you don't see it and then you could trip and fall. Um, last but not least, here's that green star in the corner. We talked about area rugs and how passionate I am about not having crazy area rug situations. Um, securing area rugs to the floor with either a double-sided non-slip tape that you can find at a Home Depot or Lowe's um, or a mat that is a non-skid mat can prevent your area rug from flipping up or moving, which can cause falls. These changes are good for everyone, not just visitors, not just for you, not just for the kids, but for everyone. So let's move on to um, lighting, but more so the light switches. So we've already talked about the importance of lighting, especially if you have low vision or any sort of visual deficit, but thinking about your, your actual electrical component of your lighting is so important. So one easy thing to do is use natural light during the day by opening the blinds and curtains to brighten the room. So going back to the very beginning of the presentation where we talked about smart home um, adaptations, there are things that you can put onto your blinds that make them motor blinds. So if you want to go all out and be able to open and close your blinds with smart home technology, you can also do that from the click of a button. If not, just making sure that you have um, easy access to open and close your blinds during the day to use that natural light. Additionally, you may want to consider improvements that um, require professional assistance like getting new blinds or taking down if you have shutters that cause your room to be very dark and you've had them for many, many years, but you're ready to use the natural light, hire a professional, make some adjustments and make sure that you're using that natural light. Um, also consider the switches. So one thing we haven't talked about yet, which is one of my favorite and most easy uh, modifications is switching your light switch either from the, the traditional, I don't see one around me, but the traditional toggle switch, if you switch it to a rocker style switch like is pictured, um, it is so much easier for someone that has fine motor deficits to turn off and on. And going even a step further, automated light switches. So the bathroom is an, an, an example. We all have gotten up and ran to the bathroom at 3 a.m. when it's pitch black in a room and forgot to turn the light on. If you have a motion detective light switch, as soon as you walk into the bathroom, your lights will turn on and long gone are the days where you forget to turn the light on. So that's another example of a, of a green star modification. Super easy, can have a handyman do that for close to nothing. Um, Stairway and hallway lighting is also important. They need to have off and on switches at both ends of the hall or stairway. So if you're going from uh, room A to room B and you get to room B and forget to turn the light off, it's so important to have a switch there so that you can save your energy, decrease your fall risk of turning around, going back to turn the light off and then walking in the dark. So just some examples and things to think about as far as lighting goes. Let's move on to living spaces and our dining areas. I love food, I live to eat. So this is one of my favorite topics. Um, dining areas aren't always traditional or formal um, like they used to be. So it's so important to think about how you use your space and what, what makes the most sense for you and your family. There was a time when most meals were served and eaten at a kitchen or dining room table, but nowadays both quick bites and full meals are often eaten on the go or at a kitchen island like we talked about before. Um, and as a result, many dining rooms are going by the wayside. But if you do have a traditional formal dining room in your home, remember that you can repurpose that room to a main level bedroom if you only have bedrooms on the second floor. Um, in the pandemic, a lot of people had to re repurpose a lot of their spaces. So my formal dining room became my office, sometimes my playroom for my kids, a craft area, a reading nook, et cetera. So thinking outside of the box of how we can make our houses, again, work for us and have flexible use of those spaces. 
Now, um, thinking about our actual comfort and utility when dining, dining table chairs with armrests are always going to be more favorable than ones without. And that's for obviously transferring purposes, getting up and down, but also support. Usually if a chair has armrest, it also is more supportive um, in the back. So if you're, if you do bond with family members or friends over long meals, making sure that you have a chair that is ergonomically supportive can prevent hip, back, shoulder, neck pain for days down the road. Um, next, talking about those islands and kitchen countertops. When those serve as your main spot for eating, it's so important that you select seating that again is sturdy and safe. Um, a lot of people love the stools that turn. I hate these. They are e extremely dangerous, um, not even for people with mobility issues, but just in general. If you miss a step or miss a turn, you can fall right off, um, torque your hip the wrong way. So ensuring that your counter, your counter top um, or island seating is safe, sturdy, and the appropriate height for your back and armrest. Um, when using the living room to dine, how many of us like to sit in front of the TV on the couch and eat dinner? <laughs> um, making sure that you use lightweight serving trays to trans transport your plates um, or taking fewer trips, or if you use a walker, using a walker tray to carry your plate from the kitchen to the living room. Um, making sure that the, again, lightweight serving trays, not only serving trays, but plates, maybe using, saving your disposable plates for when you eat in the kitchen so that the, the weight that you're carrying is less when going from one room to another. So just some things to think about from a dining perspective. Now let's move on to the living spaces, hallways, and stairs. There's some more, oh, there's my motion sensor light. So I told you I'm passionate about that one. It is a green star, so super easy. I recommend it to just about everyone that I meet um, because it is such a functional thing. But as you see in this picture, there's a light switch at the bottom and the top of the stairs. So just like I mentioned for the hallway at the front and back or front and front, whichever way you're going of the hallway, it's also so important so that you're not going up or down the stairs in the dark to have a switch at both the bottom and top of the stairs. My favorite type of stair is always going to be a hard surface stair, so like a wood or a luxury vinyl plank or tile. Um, however, if you do desire to have carpet on your stairs, the runner that is pictured here, a low pile carpet runner that is um, secure and doesn't have any bubbles or um, waving in it is going to be the safest option for a stair covering. Um, if stairs are carpeted, if you have a carpeted stair, make sure that they have a non-slip surface such as um, adhesive strips or something um, securely placed like a rubber thread or tread, I, I apologize, um, so that you don't slip on the high pile carpet. Stairs with an open back should have riser covers installed for safety. So this is talking about um, if you have an unfinished basement that you do your laundry in, or you have a hobby that you like to do in your basement, but you have the unfinished stairs, they highly recommend in the Home Fit Guide to get those stairs finished so you don't slip and your feet go through, go through the two steps. And as mentioned earlier on the exterior, same goes for interior. Handrails, handrails, handrails should be extended. Pat, well, they should be present first and foremost. A lot of people don't have handrails but they should be present and extend past the last step so that you can have that ease of transition from going from step to flooring. And you should have them on both sides. At minimum, a handrail on one side would be okay, but both sides would be ideal. Let's talk about stair lifts. So a stair lift is an alternative solution for two-story dwellings if you absolutely, and this is on the next slide, there we go. If you absolutely can't, use a flexible space like a dining room to create a bedroom on the main floor like we just talked about in the previous slide. If there's absolutely no solution um, to the two-story dwelling, you can have a stair lift. When single-story living is needed but not possible, a stair lift or chair lift, they, those terms are used synonymously, can be a practical, practical and safe mobility solution. Chair lifts aren't inexpensive, so they are very costly, but they can be a better and more affordable choice than relocating, selling and, and buying a new home. And you may be surprised to find out about other options that are available for different types of stair lifts and chair lifts. One thing to think about with 
stair lifts is that it requires a lot of core and back strength so that you can sit in the chair safely. It also requires a lot of dexterity, both gross and fine motor movements. So fine motor, motor to buckle the seatbelt, gross motor in order to sit, stand, and pivot from the chairlift without falling. So while it is a great option, I always tell people to consult an occupational therapist before spending the money on a chairlift. And I do want to highlight here that elevators are becoming so much more widely used in homes because of their increase, well, their decrease in cost and increase in effectiveness. So that you might be surprised to know that your home might be fit for an elevator if needed down the road. So we're on the last room of the house tour and I usually say best for last, but I'm gonna say last because nobody loves doing laundry. And it's the laundry room, um, adaptations and, and best practices. So the best location for a laundry room is obviously going to be near the rooms that you live in or that your clothes are taken off. However, in most homes, especially older homes, which St. Louis is filled with, a lot of the Midwest is filled with older homes, that's not always possible. So if access is an issue, laundry facilities can be moved to the main floor, a stair lift can be added or installed, or you can invest in a laundry service. So if modifying the location of your laundry room is absolutely not an option in your home, you could look into a laundry service if that would allow you to stay in your home. So quick fixes for the laundry space include investing in a laundry basket with wheels so that you're not lifting and carrying, but rather just pushing, gliding along the floor. Um, using a foldable shopping cart or um, a table in order to fold the clothes so that again, you're not carrying it from room to room. When purchasing a new washer and dryer, think about the height. Um, front loading as opposed to top loading are more ergonomically accessible because you're not having to reach over we just got front loaders and initially told them we didn't want the stands to go on. We didn't order the stands because we're frugal and we didn't want to spend the money. After one round of laundry and I was bending my back to get the, the um, wash to put in the dryer, we ordered the stands. So making sure that the height of your laundry machine, um, your wash and dryer units are ergonomically effective for whatever your height, if you're sitting, standing, what have you. Um, also, there are washer dryer combos available, so it's very important to remember that um, a combined washer and dryer unit may be a good option because they're front loading and they can do both wash and dry. So if you live in a small space and really want to bring that laundry room up to your main level of living, that is another option. So we'll move on to the, the next steps. Where do we go from here? Chelsea has done an amazing job and we have given you a ton of information. So if you remember at the beginning, it was stated that our goal today is to help you identify at least one quick fix that you can take action on right away. And I would be curious to know if any of you are going to do that, or if you just want to humor us and give us one that you are thinking about, put it in the chat, let us know what one action item um, might be, and then letting you know that you will have all of this material for you so that you can consult your professional team in making home modifications. And I will hand it over to Sheila. We'll see if anybody's going to do any action items. Check, check out the chat, and then I'll hand it over to Sheila to wrap us up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, it's starting to come in, Gretchen. Yay! So as Gretchen indicated, well, first off, thank you, Gretchen and Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, I sent Gretchen a little text saying how fantastic you are. So um, thrilled to have you as a part of the presentation. So done an amazing job. So, um, but as Gretchen indicated, ARP does have a lot of resources. In addition to the Home Fit Guide, which we will send to you, um, we have lots of worksheets and other um, links that we will send you to access to information. There are a couple on this page right here. Um, there is um, an app that we ARP developed for the home fit guide. You can take a picture of a bedroom or room and it'll ask you some questions and then it'll provide recommendations on how to make that room 
fit your needs. So it's kind of cool. I did it around my house. And then through the ARP Foundation, um, there is a, um, they have a, kind of a parallel program here to stay that will um, provide you with tips and resources on how to stay in your home safely as you age. And as has been, um, we've all witnessed today, occupational therapists rock. So um, they're a great resource um, and they do have a, uh, an organization um, that you can access. And um, I believe uh, Gretchen will be available as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we can send her information along as well. And then a certified aging in place specialist, which Gretchen is as well. And um, they really can help look at the home through the aging lens, um, which is uh, critical to allow us all to stay in our home safely again as we age. So um, before I move, Gretchen, is there anything you want to spotlight on the what was shared in the chat as far as what people are going to uh, do? A lot of people are, are excited and jazzed about motion sensor lights, which I am as well. Um, got some treads on stairs, which is great. A smart doorbell. I think that's great for safety and just for convenience, because if you're in the middle of a task and you have a solicitor at your front door, you don't want to go answer it. So these are really great things that people have taken away. And I did want to highlight um, one thing that Chelsea had talked about and what we're here to talk about is aging in place. But I so appreciate AARP taking universal design as the basis of their home fit guide, because these modifications are not just for aging people. These make life easier for everyone. So that's so important. And hats off to AARP for adopting universal design in their, in their home fit guide. Great. Thank you for that nice plug. <laughs> um, so hopefully all of these things have been accomplished. Um, I can't imagine you didn't get at least a piece of each one of these um, from the agenda. I um, indicated that we are going to be sending you an email that will have lots of stuff. We'll do the um, you can download the home fit guide, but I will also send you a physical home fit guide. And in addition, each of you will get the uh, My Home Kit, which was in the information um, that was promoting the program. And that will just have some stuff. I'll just leave it at that stuff and, and that you can use in your home to make life a little easier. But then also um, we'll send you the worksheets and other things that um, you can use with your home evaluation and modifications as you see fit. So um, we do more than just this. So um, the Home Fit Workshop happening now, uh, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum ignore that date. It's on our webpage, but it's wrong. Um, so, um, but you can check out um, everything on our webpage. You can go to arp.org slash near you and um, see everything that's happening um, in your community, whether you live in Missouri or not. And then um, one final thing, I do have a survey that, let's see if I can share it. Um, let's see. 